This episode of Sessions contains sensitive subject matter, including discussions of sexual assault, eating disorders, and suicide. We believe it is crucial to address these issues with empathy and compassion, but we also want to prioritize your emotional well-being. If you feel that these subjects may be triggering or cause discomfort, we encourage you to prioritize your mental and emotional health. If you decide to listen, we'll provide resources in the show notes for anyone who may need support. Please take care of yourself and reach out to trusted individuals or professional services if you require assistance. We appreciate your understanding, and as always, thank you for listening to Sessions. Family therapy is a must. <laughs> um, Love it. That is, you, you cannot treat an eating disorder without family therapy. It's an eating disorder in an adolescent or kiddo, that is, because majority of the you know reasons this child has adopted these patterns or something in the family system going on and the whole family has to be on board if we're gonna invite true like deep meaningful change um because it may very well be that one of the parents at home has their own disordered eating patterns it is in their own like swirl of diet culture and kiddo is hearing that and seeing that right how are we supposed to create change? We can talk all day in our therapy session about it, but they go home and they're shown the exact opposite of what we're talking about. We're not going to get anywhere. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Sessions. It's, a, it's Friday afternoon for us. Uh, we have part two. So glad to have you back, Rebecca. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, our part one was about hearing your story and some of your expertise, and it was so invaluable. And I just appreciate taking some more time to dive in a little bit more. And I know we're going to be focusing on talking about uh, a specific area of your focus and talking about LGBTQIA and um, some eating disorder stuff. But uh, certainly, welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Rebecca, just remember, just give us a little bit of refresher where you're at and um, some of your expertise and what you're doing currently in your practice would be great. Yeah. Um, so I'm Rebecca Tinker. I'm an LCSW, go by she, her pronouns, uh, located in San Francisco, California. I have a private practice here and I specialize in eating disorders and the intersection of eating disorders and gender and sexuality. I um, have a lot of adolescents um, and kiddos on the gender spectrum who are struggling with body image stuff as well as adults um, on the gender spectrum um, and also cisgender individuals who are dealing with body image and um, and internalized shame, yeah. Wow, and that's significant. I, I can only imagine, are you, um, in your experience and in your research, are you, are you seeing a, uh, a rise in that uh, demographic? Um, well, you know, it's, it's hard to say because I, prior to the pandemic, I was living um, in New England, in Vermont. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I moved to San Francisco. And I don't know if it is um, pandemic related or just San Francisco related versus Vermont related. But yes, I have a, a massive rise in folks who are non-binary or trans or gender non-conforming in some way. Um, and also a, a large increase of body shame and disordered eating. Um, I know from the statistics that are out there uh, that there's absolutely a rise in eating disorders and body shame. I just was reading something the other day about how um, the beginning of body shame is typically um, I'm going to use the word inherited, <laughs> um, but taken on and experienced around the age of 13. But more recently, they've been seeing numbers as low as nine years old. Wow. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a rise for sure. Well, maybe if you would, Rebecca, um, just to find terms, I, I like that you use the term body shame. What, what do you for those listening? How, how would you define that? 
I would define that as feeling ashamed by our bodies, feeling like we're not, our bodies aren't enough. I think that that word isn't used as much as it should be, that word enoughness, um, feeling unworthy in our body, feeling like something's wrong about our body. Um, again, not feeling enough or feeling too much. Well, I really appreciate it. And the reason I ask you, even though <laughs> the term body shame seem what, <laughs> seems what obvious, but I, I ask you that question because I was, we always get in these discussions is that oftentimes shame is not just a cortical rational brain issue, mm-hmm. is that right. shame, shame often exists lower, mm-hmm. even down into the brain stem, the autonomic, autonomic mm-hmm. nervous system, into the subcortical system. I, I just wonder if you're seeing, if you're referencing some of that, that it's not, we're not talking people out of their body shame. Well, I think that it's pretty impossible to talk people out of body shame when we're in a society that's only preaching body shame. It's a society that's built on body judgment and body hierarchy. And how do we, how do we convince someone to not live in body shame when we're being shown it every single day, you know? And even, I, I know we've been... Um doing a little bit of research on, not to get off track, but social media and how much adolescents are, you know, it's sort of like holding back the tide, being inundated with looking at social media and being faced with all these images and everything that's going on. I I wonder in your practice of that, how relevant that topic is. It's, yeah, it's hugely relevant, unfortunately. And also, like, I... Yeah, I think that social media is huge in regards to preaching the body that we should have, no matter what gender you align with um, or don't align with. There's an image that we're supposed to uphold or we're supposed to get to, and there's this like cycle of competitiveness um, and how we perceive bodies and the cycle of judgment and disrespect towards specific bodies, whether uh, it's a bodies holding disability, like surrounding ableism, surrounding sexism, surrounding um, transphobia, et cetera. There's just so much, or, or thin privilege, right? There's, um, and racism, I mean, I, I keep listing off all of these, right? But yeah, it's if, if you're someone who's not thin and tall and aligned with uh, gender assigned at birth, you're, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there are, though, I, I try and encourage, because the reality is we don't want to say, okay, all kids get off social media, especially when they're in their family's home still. I think that's actually a really safe place, or it should be. A safe place for them to start exploring that and I think by holding them away from that then we're setting them off when they go to college or wherever they go to leave the house we're, we no longer get to be in a space where we get to communicate with them about what they're seeing and we get to like dismantle it all and um, be curious about it all right um, so I do encourage families who are on the fence around social media be like, well, let's open it up, but let's point them in the direction Mm. of, you know, Instagram handles or individuals or hashtags or whatever to follow that are more affirming and, um, yeah, expanding the conversation around bodies. Yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying, Rebecca. I know that, um, yeah, the APA has recently come out with stuff that's been really based in research, but I like it that they're talking about parents uh, be proactive and know about social media literacy and even competency, like be proactive and get on there with them. And because there's some, yeah, there's some been some benefits of actually people feeling supported and there's, I can find some community within, you know, some social media if it's done right and we stay on top of it. Unfortunately, there is some susceptibility to exploitation and other things and exposure to a, I mean, lo- yeah, a lot of the things. To- yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, just because I'm an eating disorder therapist, there's like so many of my Google searches have to do with bodies. 
And I am telling you, the, the, the um, advertisements that I get on my social media is absolutely disgusting. Oh, I can only imagine. Constant, like, diet plans, and it's bad. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting, but such a relevant topic. I mean, like you're saying, like, boy, we're we're seeing across all demographics, body dysmorphia, eating disorders, body shame is really is really on the rise. Um, I, I'm always curious, what do you uh, what do you identify as some? Is that the symptomology of something deeper? How do you identify yeah. that? I mean, it, of course, it. I mean, that there's so much behind that question, I feel. I think it really varies on the individual. Um, but a lot of it is body terrorism, right? And it's, you know, one way to look at eating disorders is just in terms of control and in terms of like, maybe there's childhood trauma as we discussed in, my, in part one, right? Like I had experienced loss and sexual assault and those were two primary indicators for the onset of my own eating disorder and you see like those specific indicators actually quite often you also see you know for trans individual or gender non-conforming individual just this body um, dysphoria and not feeling like they're in the right body can lead to the onset of disordered eating patterns of wanting to suppress or enhance secondary sexual characteristics um, but also body terrorism, feeling like our bodies are constantly being judged, feeling like our bodies are constantly being scrutinized, um, for not being enough, so to speak, um, being shamed all the time, being disrespected all the time, uh, that can lead to the onset of needing disorder. So it's, it's like, it's, it's hard to say that there's one answer to that. It really depends on the individual. Um, but I think that in almost every single case, an eating disorder is the alarm. It's not the fire itself. Hmm. And the onset of the fire, you're saying, could be a whole host of things. It just really depends right. on the individual and... Sometimes. It depends on like, you know, sociodemographic. It depends on like the environments that they're living inside of in general. Depends on family systems, depends on genetics, depends on experiences that they had in early childhood, um, you know, with sexual assault in early childhood. There's no way around almost, and that's a generalization, of course, but in my you know, to, to go with the generalization, there's really no way around that child not thinking that it's somehow their fault and like their, their body was the problem. And that's why it happened. As you're describing it, Rebecca, I'm like, there is so much to consider yeah. w when being, a, you know, an effective, having this specialization, talking about eating disorders. But I like that you're saying, you know, it's... <laughs> It's really you got to get to the fire that's underneath, but it right. takes so much consideration and sensitivity that um, there's some therapists who might be a bit reductionistic or a little bit judgmental about what's driving the symptoms. Well, right. And that, you know, and I think that's a really big problem in the disorder eating, in disordered eating care, right, is... Um, we're not doing enough of our own investigating into what we think is healthy. We're not doing our own investigating into our like intersectionalities. We're not doing our own investigating into our like the judgments that we hold, right? And we're just like prescribing this like one belief that we have rather than seeing the entire like systems approach, right? Um, and that definitely needs to be incorporated more into eating disorder care. I mean, even all of our assessments that we have are not actually equipped to like fully assessing for yeah. an eating disorder. And we don't have, I mean, that's why eating disorders are so complicated and so many people hate working with them, right? It's because it's really hard to get to the, to the fire to be like, well, what, why are we here? And so much of it is social and environmental, but in this one individual's case, like what was going on? Right. Besides the fact that we live in this kind of 
gross capitalistic patriarchal world. Well, and I can only imagine too that it's, it's interesting with eating disorders is that there's a certain level if it gets to a point we have to move to stabilization before we really try to get to the therapeutic piece, I would think. I mean, it needs to happen simultaneously, but I can't imagine if you're, you know, really struggling with certain food intakes and nutritional, all this stuff. My gosh, it, it must be really hard to. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, and when we're talking about stabilization, I think that we're talking about in that way, like, seeing eating disorders only as the extremes, right? And I think that eating disorders is like a huge spectrum, mm. right? And someone can have just as much of an eating disorder, even if they have like more or less healthy vitals as someone who is like on a feeding tube, right? It's just that they're engaging in different patterns that are allowing their vitals to be in a different space. Boy, I love that you bring that up. It is that, yeah, it's not the... <laughs> it's hard not to judge the book by its cover, right? Like it's the right. the amount of suffering and the maladaptive behaviors can be there. And right. it's really about exploring and, and getting underneath it. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Rebecca. Well, yeah. can I ask, just changing gears a little bit, uh, what, what led you to work with this certain population or have this focus, if you don't mind sharing? No, I don't mind at all. Um, I think it's, a few different parts. Um, one is upon moving to the Bay Area, I just got inundated with client referrals of folks on the gender spectrum who were struggling with disordered eating and body shame. And, um, and there aren't a lot of therapists who specialize in eating disorders. So I was like, well, I guess I need to, I guess I need to like really refine my expertise in the queer community and in the gender expansive communities um, because there's there's a high need for that here. Um, but then also in recognizing like in the numbers, like this is also very much an underserved community mm. and a lot of uh, trans and gender nonconforming folks when being assessed for an eating disorder goes missed. Um, because their symptoms don't align in similar ways to cisgender individuals, especially cisgender, um, like cis females, right? And, and cis white females even more so. I feel like I, I, I took the, on this specialty in particular because of the influx of need for the most part. Um, and because the, it's, it's underserved. And, and also, you know, the, because it's underserved, well, not just because it's underserved in part because it's underserved, but also in part because of the intersection and the comorbidity, so to speak, um, suicidality rates are in so much higher in trans populations than they are, um, in cisgender populations for folks, um, dealing with eating disorders. And that to me too, is like, that's a crisis. Right. And someone has people have to show up for that. Um, and if I'm getting, you know, I moved to San Francisco and all of a sudden I have, you know, 20 referrals for folks who are on the gender spectrum, also dealing with eating disorders. Clearly, you have a problem. And w would you say I would imagine within that demographic, is there a higher you're seeing a higher ratio of those within the population having eating disorders or? I mean, you mentioned suicide being, I think it is higher within that, the ratio of suicide is higher within that population. And it's higher also for um, non gender non-conforming population who are experiencing eating disorders. The suicide rate is tenfold of oh. cisgender individuals with eating disorders. I do know that um, in one study that I think was a PRIDE study that happened in like 2018 or something, um, it was saying that uh, folks who had gone to treatment, both gender non-conforming individuals as well as cisgender individuals, left treatment and still the suicidality rate for the gender non-conforming individuals was the exact same. Wow. No reduction. No reduction. 
Wow, that is it a was a reduction in some behaviors, but the suicidality was the same. And that to me goes back to the body terrorism. So maybe define that a little bit. When you use the word body terrorism, I, I would love a good definition of that. It'd be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in my perspective, body terrorism is when suicide is preferred over living another day being judged and ridiculed and shamed by the society surrounding you. So the terrorism is coming externally. You're being Onto their bodies. terrorized yeah. about my body. And mm -hmm. you feel that. And in some way, correct me if I'm wrong, it creates a sense of terror inside you. Exactly. Yeah. The fear of living another day under the disrespect and the scrutiny and the judgment um, toward your body. And I'm just... I, I'm just thinking, I wonder how many people would say, well, who cares what other people think of you, right? Like, I mean, how many people want to say, like, just let that go, or who cares what they say, or blah, blah, blah. And yet, it's not the way it works. No, it's not at all the way it works. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, like, we want to come back to a space of self-love and that, like, radical self-love, right, where it's, like, going back to the origin of self-love. And when I think about that. I'm reminded of um, Sonia Renee Taylor. Are you familiar with her work? No, not so much. Um, she wrote about this radical self-love and, uh, and how like radical <clears throat> the definition is like our origin, our root, right? And when you imagine yourself as an infant, you were only excited about your body, right? You like discovered your hands. You're like, oh my God, I have hands. They're so cool. I'm like, I can roll around and I can like, and I have toes. And like, there's no comparison. There's no judgment. It's just this like complete fascination and like joy of being in a body, right? And at least that's the hope, of course, there's the population of folks who, who didn't feel safe even as, as infants in their bodies, right? But um, for the majority of all of us, we found our hands and we were completely stoked on that. Um, or like feeling our bellies. Like I have, my niece is one years old and she just like grabs at her little rolls and is like thrilled by it, right? Um, and that's that like body terrorism takes away the excitement takes away the joy because it's the constant ridicule and judgment of our form. And can we come into a space of that like deep loving, that like core based knowledge of how beautiful it can be to be in a body and, and like feeling that aliveness and that enoughness, no matter what other people think. However, at the same time, as you said, when we're being subjected to the onslaught of uh, judgment and shame and ridicule and laws that go against your body, it's, it's pretty hard to cultivate that. Very hard to cultivate that. And I, I, I so appreciate this, Rebecca, because I can't help but think, especially, you know, my, my own expertise in being an attachment is that this principle, like you're saying, the discovery of the hands for the t the infant or the t you know the toddler, I, I can't help but think that principle of wonderment and amazement and mm -hmm. curiosity is often facilitated because of this interpersonal social dynamic with a oftentimes a loving, nurturing, reliable caregiver that provides this environment that it's safe enough to be to have the wonderment to do those things and what's fascinating is is I, I hear you saying that social dynamic there's this interpersonal thing that still carries with us i mean we're kind of hardwired for to be social creatures and just mm -hmm. to say well like no I, i'll move into self-love on an island in a vacuum right which is impossible which is impossible actually we we need to shift that mentality well, just, right. lo just love yourself enough and you can overcome all of this stuff. But the reality is you're saying that, no, relationships and social engagement and all of this is an essential piece of this process. Right. And right. I feel like there's um, so much talk about, like, you need to love yourself first before you have space to, like, love others and to receive love from others. And I actually I disagree. 
I think that we are taught how to love ourselves mm. by others from a very early age. And if we're not given that teaching or that, or that teaching is taken away by the environments that surround us or the voices that surround us, or that teaching is, you know, drowned out, I, I want to know that we can love ourselves even when that's happening, but it feels that is something that is an anomaly still to me. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to do that. I, th I know that it's possible, but I think that there has to be a bigger uprooting of change in our society for that to, to be the, like, for that deep change to actually occur. Yeah, so it's possible, and I'm even wondering, we're talking about this uh, relational dynamic is so important to us as human beings, certainly. And then obviously being terrorized by somebody reflects that we also have the ability to be soothed or accepted by others to help us integrate that whole process. And I, I'm wondering, often talk, oftentimes we talk about the therapist-client relationship, sometimes that's that can be the catalyst or the only place or the beginning of where some of these clients feel a sense of acceptance, feel a mm -hmm. sense of, you know, gosh, I go to see Rebecca. She's she's removed some of that judgment and actually accepts me no matter if I feel shame, no matter if I feel worthy or not. And it may, maybe talk a little bit about that. I'm just sort of yeah, thinking well, about that, that experience. I think that just shows to the the power of our small connections with people whether it's a ther therapeutic relationship or whether it's a relationship with the person who always checks you out at the grocery store or whether it's the you know random person you see at the dog park or whatever it is right i think that there's something to that but yeah the therapeutic relationship in going back to what you were naming of attachments right like that's that's an attachment that has to be built. And in my work, I definitely, like before we even dive into doing their deep uh, unblending of the eating disorder, getting to know the eating disorder, I first want to know that we have an attachment mm. and that we have like, that we both, that like they feel safe in the room with me and that they can open up. And so it's sometimes that means just like, for <laughs> a couple of sessions to be like, hey, what's going on? Like, tell me about your, week how are you what do you like what's you know what, what have you been thinking about like let's get to know each other's brains and let's get to know how it feels to sit in the room together and then once we feel that connection that safety let's let's go a little bit deeper yeah wow i i like that establishing that making sure the attachment is there uh, yeah. I, I wanted to say this to you, Rebecca, just being an eating disorder expert. I was always curious because I'm not. Um, when we talk about treatment, I'm like, well, do all the people who are coming to you, is it just overt that they have an eating disorder? And I was talking to somebody else who was um, in the field and I said, well, you know, at Embark, we have these programs and blah, blah. And I said, we're, we're thinking about getting into eating disorder. And the person looked at me and she laughed and she said, Rob, you have them in your program. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are you sure? Like, well, that made sense, but you can't imagine how much of it's unidentified and it's not overt and it's not like this. So I, I've always been so curious. I'm like, well, of course, yes, yes. You know, how, how do they come to you? I mean, has it been identified or is that something you discover? Or how, how? Sometimes... They, you know, some adolescents, it's parents reaching out being like, oh my God, we're realizing our child has an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. They need help immediately. Or it's a physician contacting me, or it's a nutritionist contacting me, or, um, or it's an individual themselves specifically stating, I'm dealing with body image, disordered eating, body dysphoria, whatever it might be. And I also have a really large population of clients too who it's not until eight months in three years in three months in whatever it is that they start saying things and i'm like huh, huh i wonder and then i start to you know engage in some inquiry 
around what they're naming in regards to their relationship with food or I'm thinking of a client in this moment who um, almost it felt as though they were like almost trying to out themselves mm-hmm. without outing themselves by saying, oh, I just haven't eaten it all yet. And they'd say that in a few sessions in our, in our appointments at noon. And I'd be like, hmm. And eventually I asked about body image or like, oh, I'm wondering about that. And so it is like sometimes it comes out much later and it wasn't the primary reason why they came according to them. However, a lot of the issues that they came to me with are maybe stemmed from like, I don't know what the chicken or the egg is, but, and which comes first anyways, but it is very interwoven with uh, with the um, concerns that they originally had. I think most of us have body shame. Yeah. We live in a judgmental world <laughs> where our, the human form is, is constantly being judged. I think that there's uh, an emphasis on a right size, no matter what our gender is, no matter what... Um, our bone structure is, you know. When it gets very confusing with uh, what is healthy and sometimes that gets a ton of affirmation and recognition for losing weight or putting on muscle mass or doing this. It's like, you know, it gets really tricky and it's like, yeah, what's healthy versus what is. And I would imagine as a therapist, you have to develop this uh, real attunement, if you will, that you're constantly having to read between the lines and look at the words and what are these subtleties to let us know that mm-hmm. yeah well and, and that is something that i'm actually glad you brought up because there is a higher degree of eating disorders now that um are being missed in the assessments mm-hmm. um but are absolutely still just as much eating disorders for folks who are um, uh, intermittent fasting or like bulking, like muscle bulking or um, on these like liquid diets or like whatever it is, like there's such a huge increase of that actually recently um, from what I'm seeing And, and those are going completely missed. And so do some of those things get filed? I'm Because I'm thinking of, you know, and just talking overtly is, you know, in getting on Instagram or whatever it is, I, I, you happen to see a lot of muscle building, bulking type of things. And it, it, can that be, even that, doing that be intertwined with body dysmorphia? Mm-hmm. I mean, in having Absolutely, these... Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to this feeling of not enoughness, Mm. right? And grasping to something outside of you to change what's inside of you, right? And this need, and sure, of course, there can be like healthy ways to navigate this. Like I am, I am an athlete, and it took a lot of work to figure out, okay, what what do I need to eat that's actually healthy to make sure that I can do the running that I want to do and make sure that my running isn't about um, losing weight, right? Which like society has told us, oh, if you're doing these things, it means that you're trying to look that certain way. And, And so it gets really hard for people to unwind from that belief and just to be like, no, I run because I actually love the way the wind feels on my skin and I love feeling the invigoration of like my strength and I, and I love to feel strong and I love to feel um, like it makes me feel empowered, not because it makes my body look a certain way, but because of like the abilities, like being able to like honor and cherish and take advantage of my body's abilities. Right. Um, but so, but it, but it is hard to un- unwind from this. Like, am I buying into some, um, diet culture or buying into some kind of muscle bulking culture, whatever. So to, um, it, it becomes materialistic and also capitalistic. 
right? Hmm. And is that is that about feeling alive in my body or is that about numbing from something? That's really hard to discern, which is why, so, again, so many eating disorders go undiagnosed and untreated. Well, as you're describing, I'm thinking about, wow, how, how much of, how many of us are striving to disconnect from our bodies? <laughs> exactly. Right. Rather than being mindful and present and accepting mm -hmm. and how, how that feels. Well, that's, that's inc thank you so much, Rebecca. So if I can ask, um, what is a typical presentation? Is there a typical presentation for an adolescent? You, you might be inquiring or a parent calling you up. Is, it, is, is there some? Um, no, <laughs> there's not a typical presentation. Um, in general, a lot of my adolescents that I see who are struggling with disordered eating are highly intelligent, mm. are quote unquote perfectionist to some degree, um, feeling this like constant strive for perfection, um, <clears throat> are they have some sort of um, trauma history or injustice around their body that they've experienced um, or that they are currently experiencing um, and or hyper-controlling parents. Mm. That's And when you're in a family system or, or really um, high-achieving parents, and the client, the kiddo then feeling like, well, I'm never going to be as smart as them. I'm never going to be as accomplished as them. So I might as well be perfect in this other way. Or, and that's, you know, I will say that's more so speaking to anorexia, right? Um, or like, but, but on the gender spectrum, it's, it really truly is like, I don't feel aligned with my gender. I want to escape my body. My body is not a safe place to be. I want gender affirming surgery, gender affirming hormones to be in the body that makes me feel like myself. And when you're in a family system where the parents aren't ready for you to go into that, or if you're living in a state where that's not even uh, accessible, there's not much we can do do besides like, yeah, let's sit with the discomfort, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a whole spectrum of things. And I don't know if I can say like, these are the primary things. There's a few that are commonalities, but yeah. Well, that that's super helpful. Cause I imagine if, you know, therapists, this is a growing field and not all therapists are experts. So it's good to know that, yeah, there are some general things we can look for, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a bunch I mean, of bunch of unique. Yeah. And and I think another thing, like common patterns that these individuals engage in would be not wanting to eat in a group setting, cutting their food really small into small little pieces. So it looks like they've eaten a lot more than they actually have. Um constantly wanting to weigh themselves or they do the body checks where you like put your fingers around your wrist and you put your fingers around your forearm, mm -hmm. around your upper arm, making sure your fingers can always touch or, you know, but, but something we're not talking about in this is then binge eating and binging and purging. And there are less of those body checks and more so of the, like, you know, if you were to look at it in an IFS, um, an internal family systems mm -hmm. lens, the, um, more, anorexia type symptoms are more managerial and the binging and purging are a lot more like the firefighters hmm. in internal family systems, right? And the firefighters are um, numbing out in these other ways that are a little bit more chaotic and the managers are numbing out and by way of control. So if I can ask, how do you view integrating all of these parts if you're <laughs> talking about ifs all these parts of self how do you really view treatment i mean f f from your lens 
Well, I think we need to leave space to hear the story of the manager or the firefighter to keep going with IFS, right? We need to leave space to hear the voice of the eating disorder. And I think a lot of treatment modalities push the eating disorder voice out and don't allow that to have room to express itself. And we're not going to get anywhere if it's like managers and, and firefighters are there to protect an exiled part. But they're not going to budge unless they feel validated. Hmm. And we have to first confront what's protecting the exiled part to be able to ever reach the exile. And so it's, a, it's about understanding, respecting, having compassion for the engagement in these patterns. And then we can get to what's underneath it. But we first has to have to leave room for for the voice of the eating disorder itself. Leave room for the voice that is experiencing that body terrorism. Leave room for the voice that wants to just fight back and is angry. So hear, hear the voice. Uh, it, I always use the term empathy before strategy. How many right. want to move towards strategy right away, but the that exiled part, is it's going to, what you resist persists, right? I mean, it's going mm -hmm. to, if we don't allow that, that aspect and to hear that voice, we can't mm -hmm. possibly integrate it. Mm -hmm. Right. Totally. Totally. And yeah. I like the term extinguish it because I don't know that it ever goes away, but it's, right. it's about integrating those pieces. So, right, right, right. So yeah. for, for you, you go into this treatment mindset of hearing the voice and doing that. And then most mm -hmm. parents are probably wondering, well, when do we get to the strategy? When do we get to the coping skills? <laughs> and right. we give them coping skills along the way, right? We're not ignoring the fact that there's a problem. We're, we're talking about, and, and also, side note, family therapy is a must. Um, Love it. That is, you, you cannot treat an eating disorder without family therapy. It's an eating disorder in an adolescent or kiddo, that is. Because the majority of the, you know, reasons this child has adopted these patterns or something in the family system going on. And the whole family has to be on board if we're going to invite true, like deep, meaningful change. Um, Cause it may very well be that one of the parents at home has their own disordered eating patterns it is in their own like swirl of diet culture and kiddo is hearing that and seeing that. Right. How are we supposed to create change? We can talk all day in our therapy session about it, but they go home and they're shown the exact opposite of what we're talking about. We're not going to get anywhere. Right. Um, and I want to also leave space for the parents to learn, okay, we need to back off from telling them exactly what they're supposed to eat, exactly how much they're supposed to eat. We need to back off for a minute. Um, and, and, and my approach to that is this part in the majority of cases wants control. And if you take all of its control away, it's going to start coming out in another way. Mm. So we give it options. We might need them to eat a certain amount of calories. We can say, hey, these are all the ways in which you could get these calories. You, you choose to eat it. You can either eat like this entire plate of pasta or whatever it is, or you can eat this chicken and veggies, or you can eat this like, you know, carrot sticks and peanut butter, like whatever it is, like here's your here's your menu, choose from it as you please, right? And giving them that freedom because so often in treatment, with all the power being taken away from the client, there's no room for the client to actually understand intuitive eating and to build that skill of intuitive eating because they're, they're not inside of their body when they're eating, they're looking at the other person's judgment and perception and critique on is this enough or is this not enough, right? And we want them to start building that inner receptive experience of, of feeling their body. What does it feel like after five bites? Can we feel the difference in our belly? Like, can we, are we tasting the food? What does it even taste like? And starting to find more descriptive words. And we can do that in a session. Sometimes I eat with my mm. clients. We have meals together or, or snacks together. And we talk about what does it taste like? Why did you bring that snack over another snack? Not why, like, how come you like that snack? 
right? And getting to know what does it even like, what does it feel like to chew that? What does it feel like to digest that? What does it feel like in your body once that's already there now? And what does it feel like 10 minutes later after having eaten it? So I love that you're saying we, we actually create experiences. We will create some of those experiences in the session. And I would imagine you're saying family therapy is so essential. Mm-hmm. How hard is it to break that homeostasis, if you will, of the family system? to Because they need to take it home, right? I mean, they've got to take it out of the office to practice those things. I wonder mm-hmm. in your experience, I would imagine sometimes it's pretty difficult for the family to change their their patterns. Yeah, I have worked with many families at this point and the majority of them um, trust what I'm doing with the, their child, but they push back a lot um, for the most part. There's like the original pushback on, on my inquiry into, into their self-inquiry, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of pushback and a lot of like, well, it's not us. It's just them. And I'm like, we're not, we're not helping your child by identifying them as the patient. Hmm. We cannot just be identifying them as the patient. We have to say, we're all in this together. We are all learning new coping skills. We are all learning new ways to be as a family. And you just happen to like inform us that we all need to be here. Um, and, and parents eventually get really on board for the most part, but there's a lot of families who push back and a lot of families who just no show in the family, uh, therapy sections. And, and that's a tricky thing to navigate, of course. (laughs) Well, and the no show perpetuates the problem, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Can I ask for, uh, therapists and professionals listening to this? What are some, are there some resources that you give the family? I mean, if there's recommendations or any resources that you like to recommend? Yeah, I think there are a lot of really awesome um, books on eating disorders. Um, Shrill by Lindy West is a really good book. Um, The Body's Not an Apology uh, Mm -hmm. is a really great book by Sonia Renee um, Taylor. Um, there's there's also a workbook that comes along with that. Um, the Hayes approach, healthy at every size. Um, they have a website that has a ton of really awesome resources on it. Um, on my website, there's also a bunch of different books that you can find. Um, so mention that oh, website real quick. So if if they uh, want to go to Rebecca Tinker dot com. So R E B E K A H. Great. And we'll, we'll post that on there too. Yeah. So people can access it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another really great book that just came out recently, um, is I'm glad my mother died. Whoa. Have you heard of this book? No, it's a provocative um, title. <laughs> I know. And, um, but it's really awesome because the author, which I'm blanking on her name in this moment, but I can find it in a second. Um, she was a child actress. And so she was very much in that social media world. She was very much in, um, she is one of the people that we look at to say that's what our body should, should be, right? And she comes out as having an eating disorder and that her mom really enforced her to have the eating disorder so that she could be in this community. Anyway, it's a, it's a really awesome memoir. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you for the resources. I know those those will be helpful for the professionals um, yeah. listening. Um, yeah. I, I always love to ask if I'm a therapist or, or, or a professional, what are the top three things I should know about doing eating disorders or the LGBT trans community? Um, what would you say? Uh, I would say you have to consider this body terrorism. You'd have to consider the society, the environment, the systems that we're growing up inside of, um, that those cannot go unlooked because that is the source of the validation that the majority of our clients need to hear. Um, Whether it's that the eating disorders onset was from sexual assault 
whether the eating disorder onset was from um, not feeling aligned with their sexual characteristics or their gender um, assigned to them, whether it's because of a loss or whatever, they all of these things lead them to not be in a normative space, mm. right? And lead them to be more ridic- more um, apt for ridicule, judgment, shame, etc. Um, and and the, these things always have to be considered. The systems and the environment always have to be considered um, for the kiddo, the adolescent, to actually feel heard. I think that's the by far the number one thing. And then also the eating disorders don't have a look, right? They don't look a certain way. Um, you can see a perfectly healthy looking individual come into your office and they may be one of the sickest clients you have. Um, and, and to also look at your own biases and your own intersectionalities and how that are informing your care because they're always going to be informing your care and making sure that you're really owning up to all of that and doing your own self inquiry. Yeah. When I'm even thinking of that, this can be, um, the terrorism or the degree cannot be judged in the sense of, I think of little, what might be perceived as little looks or gestures or ridicules or even, you know, jokes or whatever. Somebody might not feel like they're a big deal, but like, I mean, they can just be profoundly painful as they continue to stack up. And there's little, you know, all of these, maybe even more than microaggressions, but it, there are all these little things that take place that, you know, we need to grow in our sensitivity, not just as therapists, yeah. professionals, but as a society that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's like in comedy culture, right? Like, why are we. It's not funny to be making fun of someone. Make fun of yourself. If you need to make fun of someone, make fun of someone like you or that is you. Don't make fun of folks who are disabled or who are trans or who are females or like rape culture or whatever it is. Like that's, it's not funny. And we need to take that away. I appreciate that. So my, my last question is, Rebecca, is that, if I'm a therapist or professional looking into this eating disorder thing, you know, in, in the world of psychotherapy, there's all kinds of evidence-based modalities that get ev- added every year to SAMHSA. I'm just wondering when it comes to eating disorder, you know, is there a bunch of modalities? What should we consider? What's, you know, is there something that are more attuned than others? I know that you spoke of intuitive eating happens to be one organized form of this maybe just speak a little bit to yeah what what is the world of eating disorders and modality yeah. how, how do we go about navigating that i think the majority of system approaches are really great with eating disorders like internal family systems is really awesome working with eating disorders also looking at health at every size um is an awesome model that you can kind of like um shift in your own way to to meet your specific client um psychodynamic approaches of course um also including like cbd cbt um so like giving homework and tools and and coping skills right that's always really important um yeah okay so there's not I, I'm not hearing you say there's this one eating disorder no. modality. No, 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 no. It's got to be I, the DBT of eating disorder is what you have to do. I'm not hearing you say that. Right. And that's, yeah, and I just think that especially like because, because it is such a systemic issue huh. and it's like a uh, issue of inequity in our society um, that we're dealing with. There's not, I don't think any one modality is going to work. I mean, I would encourage folks to move from a more like liberation psychology lens from like health at every size lens from uh, internal family systems based lens. Right. But I don't think that. Yeah, no, there's not like one modality and I don't know if maybe 
maybe there is one out there that I'm unaware of, but I, <laughs> but I highly doubt there's going to be one that fits for everybody, especially when we're thinking about the differences of gender, the differences of symptoms, the differences of experiences that led to the onset, et cetera. Yeah. Great. Um, if I, if I'm a parent and I suspect my, just have, you know, suspect something's going on, what would you recommend if I'm a parent? Where, where do I go? Who do I talk to? Um, first, you got your own therapy, I would say, if you, and, and, and try and have a conversation with your kid in a non-shaming way, but by saying like, hey, how are you doing? Like, be upfront, be confrontational, seek a therapist for them. If you have serious concerns about uh, their vitals, they definitely need to be seeing a, their primary care physician um, on a regular basis to be checking in on that um, because this is a, a deadly disorder, right? Um, but, but don't shame them. Do your own work. Um, have compassion for their experience. They're, they're suffering, right? And remind them about the joy one can feel when being in a body and show that to them by example and ask yourself, are you feeling alive in your body? And if not, maybe figure out ways in which you can start doing that and, and showing your kid that aliveness and, and having your kid join in on you, join in with you on those activities or experiences. Um, reminiscing on that joy that maybe you once felt or that you saw your kiddo once feeling um, and returning to that together. That's super, so helpful. Um, I keep saying the last thing I'm going to say, but this is the last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> I, I wonder if people say, um, are you ever cured or is it remission? Is it, how do we talk about this thing? Because, you know, when it comes to alcoholism, people say it's not a cure. It's a maintenance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how is it with eating disorder. And I, I've fluctuated, but I don't think that it's a cured thing. I think that it's at one point the voice is in the driver's seat, and then maybe the voice moves to the passenger seat, and then maybe at some point the voice gets to move to the way, way back. Um but it's something that likely is always like in our van, so to speak. <laughs> We're driving this like really long van. Hopefully it's in the way, way back. And we might hear it pipe up every once in a while. Or we might have little memories of its voice if we can't hear it any longer. Um, but it's there. And it's a part of our past. And, and, and our past doesn't just stop existing. It's always a part. It's always informing who we are today, you know. Wonderful answer. Rebecca, thank you so much. And I want to say to all the listeners, I mean, it has been an absolute, I've learned so much from having Rebecca on our podcast. I'm so grateful to you. This has been Sessions with Rebecca Tinker. And uh, yeah, please access podcasts wherever you get those and access though. And we just really love having you. So Rebecca, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rob.